I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land upon which we meet, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. I pay my respects to their elders, past and present. My name is Wee Tan, and I'm the 2016 Executive Editor of the University of New South Wales Law Journal. Welcome to the launch of issue 39.3, which is the third issue of four to be published this year. In particular, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to Mark Iris SC, to Michael Vrisakis and the partners and solicitors of Herbert Smith Freehills, to Associate Professor Lyria Bennett Moses, representing the UNSW Faculty of Law, and of course the editorial board of the journal and its alumni. I'm also delighted to welcome two of this issue's contributing authors, Professor Luke McNamara and Associate Professor Julia Quilter. At the journal, we're proud of our work and of our status as a leading academic law journal. But our achievements would never be possible without the generous assistance of others whom I'd now like to thank. On behalf of the editorial board, thank you to Herbert Smith Freehills, our host for this evening and premier sponsor of the journal. Herbert Smith Freehills has been a great supporter of our journal for 34 years now. The journal could not be what it is today without its partnership with the firm. I thank Herbert Smith Freehills partner, Michael Vrisakis, for representing the firm here this evening, as well as James Keane and Elizabeth Pitaway Burnell for their considerable assistance in organizing this launch. I'd also like to express my gratitude to our other two premier sponsors, Allens and Kingwood Mallisons, for their ongoing support of the journal. As a student-run journal, we are very grateful to our Dean, Professor George Williams, and to our faculty advisors, Professor Rosalind Dixon and Associate Professor Lyria Bennett Moses. Their advice and support has proved invaluable. Next, I want to acknowledge our student editorial board. Each article in this issue has been edited multiple times over with skill and care. Our editors are all volunteers and are a diverse group, united by a fascination with rules of legal citation. <laughs> I am immensely privileged to work with each of them. I would now like to take a moment to congratulate David Yang, who is the editor of this issue. David has been responsible for the carriage of this issue since its inception as a proposal to the editorial board over 12 months ago. His idea has become this reality, which you have in your hands, through his tireless work. David is a person of extremes. He very much enjoys international criminal law, the concept of editorial discretion, and a good wine. <laughs> on the other hand, he very much dislikes long meetings, uh, meetings on Saturdays, and uh, come to think of it, most meetings in general. <laughs> David is the first to admit he knows nothing about a particular topic, but in any conversation about international criminal law, he speaks on it with amazing depth and authority. It is that passion for the law which has driven this outstanding issue, and his humility and good humor, that have made him such a joy to work with. Congratulations, David, on this excellent achievement. It has occurred to me that this is the last launch at which I'll get the chance to say anything, as I'm on a vacation of sorts uh, during the next one. I want to acknowledge the work of Andrew Roberts, who is the editor of that issue. Apart from performing his issue editor duties to the highest standard, Andrew has driven the development of the UNSW Law Journal's three-year strategic plan. Andrew is deeply passionate about whatever organization he chooses to be part of, and if there's a way to make something simpler and better, he'll find it and draft a discussion paper about it in what spare time he has. Importantly, Andrew is always open to debate and disagreement and has contributed immeasurably to the journal. I'm very fortunate to work with him and with other excellent editors like David and the rest of the team, and I look forward to seeing the strategic plan adopted and implemented by future editorial boards. Finally, I'd like to introduce Michael Vrisakis to speak on behalf of the firm. Michael is a corporate partner at Herbert Smith Freehills. He's a leading practitioner in the area of non-contentious regulation with considerable expertise on the regulation of retail financial services and products. We are very grateful for his time. Thank you, Michael. Thank you very much. I, I, um, I was honored to talk to the uh, new intake of um, students doing the um, JD at New South Wales uh, by the Dean and I had prepared assiduously my speech 
and it was to do it was entitled the practice of law in a post tolkien uh, environment <laughs> and it was replete with images of taken from tolkien and also from other aspects of more modern Australian mythology, including the castle. And I will briefly um, mention some of those in a second. The association, more importantly, the association between Herbert Smith Freehills and the University of New South Wales Law School is long standing, with clearly um, our pride, I, I guess it's fair to say, in relation to the library, the law library. Uh, in relation to many of our uh, partners and many of our alumni who have gone through the law school. So I was delighted to be able to speak. In, in more recent times, I'm also on the recruitment panel of Herbert Smith Freehills, uh, who we interview, obviously, people for clerkships, which becomes the basis for graduate employment. And it's fantastic to meet so many students from UNSW and other law schools and, 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 and talk to them about what they're studying. One of the things that we are passionate about is also the relationship between the law school and the practice of law in a, in, 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 in a number of different ways. I, I, I briefly want to talk about the uh, relationship with the academic practice, uh, the academic side of of law. Um, we were fortunate enough, I was saying earlier, to have had Margaret Stone in our uh, team as a consultant after she left the federal court. Many of you will be aware of her very illustrious career, um, including at the law school. And we have a philosophy which is that the people who are practised in this area, and we've called on people like Samoa Degling and others, Scott Donald, uh, one of the lecturers at UNSW, consults to our team, to see those resources as incredibly valuable in our practice of law because it informs and bridges the academic and intellectual into the very practical. So we are delighted to have those associations and I think the role of the Law, law Journal is incredibly important in that respect in terms of fostering that learning. You may think that when we go into practice, when we leave law school, that we forget those things. The very point is we can't forget those things. And the point is that we need to keep abreast and we need to rely on people who are at the leading edge of this intellectual and academic pursuit of excellence in knowledge. And I, rightly or wrongly, made the illusion between, the allusion between the people who we consult with in terms of academic academia, including the New, New South Wales Law School, to being the wizards, uh, a la the reference to Tolkien society and, you know, the keepers of the sacred flame. Uh, those of you who know Lord of the Rings will know the reference to Gandalf. I had to, I had to qualify the fact that that's not to say we want to invoke the image of these pe people wearing pointy hats, although I do note that when you receive your doctorate there, you get to wear more elaborate headwear, uh, something for those who aspire to an academic career uh, can look forward to in terms of the, 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 the way in which the headdress does get more elaborate as you progress through your degrees. I did, on, I did want to say also that I made perhaps a misjudgment in terms of the research and all the efforts I put into my paper in not realising that when I talked about Australian mythology and, the car and in particular the castle, that icon of a movie which depicts, as people may know, the um, and I thought George Williams had invited me to do it, the reference to 5131 of the Constitution was irresistible to me, to mention the castle and to talk about the fact, the analogies, and when I went into practice, I never realised that I actually would be giving advice on a on on that sort of a topic being the constitution. So, um, but I made these analogies to Dennis Denuto, the actor, and the fact that I didn't have any uh, dictating skills and, and I wasn't a very good typist, but I could see a lot of the students taking notes. Michael, not very good at dictation. Michael, not very good at <laughs> typist. And I'm sort of missing the point about the reference to the mythology. And I realised later that as a lot of the people were not from an Australian cultural background, perhaps the jokes were falling a bit flat. Um, but I just wanted to finish my thoughts in just giving, a, uh, giving our appreciation of the contributions that go into the Law Journal and the efforts of the people who put the this publication, excellent publication together, and the efforts of those people who contribute to it, because 
I want people to know that that contribution absolutely plays an important role in the practice of commercial law. So on that note, can I exit stage right and just introduce David, who's one of the people obviously who's put the effort into this publication and again, um, I just wanted to acknowledge the excellence of that publication. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the launch of issue 39.3 of the University of New South Wales Law Journal. Each issue of the journal contains two distinct yet equally important components, the general and the thematic. The general component of this issue contains nine outstanding articles which explore a range of contemporary legal issues. They discuss the significance of intoxication in Australian legislation, the crime of arson, the Office of the Independent National Security Legislation Monitor, court authorised sterilisation, voting rights, corporate whistleblowing, private tax rulings, standing for judicial review and the 2015 statistics on the High Court. I would like to take a moment to briefly mention Jesse Blackburn's article, which evaluates the Office of the Independent National Security Legislation Monitor. The article commends the Monitor on, for effectively reviewing the government's counterterrorism policies and making effective recommendations. However, it criticises the government for its lack of responses to these recommendations by completely ignoring those reports when they have been tabled into Parliament. Jesse's findings are particularly important given the government continues to introduce new anti-terror legislation into Parliament at a relatively fast pace. For example, two weeks ago, Attorney General George Brandis announced the introduction of two new counter-terrorism bills. The first expands the control order regime to target children as young as 14. The second creates a mechanism for continuing detention of high-risk terrorist offenders in a similar way that New South Wales has created a regime for high-risk sex and violent offenders. Thus, as Jessie explains in her article, an effective mechanism for post-enactment review is so critical to ensuring that these laws actually work and ensuring that they are consistent with Australia's human rights obligations. Now, for the thematic component, there are four articles which examine the international community's response to terrorism. And this is precisely what the aim of the thematic was. It was to explore how terrorism is or how it can be regulated by international law. After all, terrorism is a transnational crime. As explained best by Kimberly Trapp, one of the contributing authors of this issue, the international terrorism suppression regime is characterised by its very piecemeal development. It has come about in response to a whole range of headline grabbing events. And this is the same at the national level. So what we effectively have is an extremely fragmented legal order. What we have is laws that respond only to particular headline grabbing situations and laws that do not necessarily address the issue as a whole. And it is only with international cooperation and the sufficient level of political will that a cohesive solution may be reached. And it is my hope that the four articles in this issue will contribute to the legal discourse surrounding terrorism and how it can be regulated by international law. This issue, as Leanne noted, started about 15 months ago with my idea for a thematic. And it is the product of many, many hours of hard work by a significant number of people to whom I am extremely grateful. First, I would like to thank Associate Professor Sarah Williams Dr. Michael Gukok and Dr. Lucas Lazinski for their guidance during the development of this proposal. I'm also grateful to our Dean, Professor George Williams, and our faculty advisors, Associate Professor Lyria Bennett-Moses and Professor Rosalind Dixon 
for their invaluable assistance throughout the publication process. I would of course like to thank our host for tonight, Herbert Smith Freehills, and our other premier sponsors, Allens and King and Wood Mallisons, for their continued support throughout the years. I would also like to thank the authors, some of whom are here tonight. I am grateful for their very insightful contributions to the issue, and it has been a pleasure to work with every one of them. Of course, I wish to thank the anonymous peer reviewers for their detailed comments on each article. Because the journal is entirely managed and produced by a voluntary student board, the opinions of the peer reviewers are particularly important in how we make our publication decisions. And without their continued support, the journal would not be able to publish the high quality articles that it does now. I would also like to express my sincere gratitude to every member of the Law Journal's editorial board. Each of them dedicate a significant amount of time to edit all the articles in this issue. And they do this with incredible diligence and professionalism. And for that, I am extremely grateful. I would also like to thank Damien, Bridget, Andy, Max, Zoe, Justin and Weanne, my colleagues on the executive committee, for their unwavering support and continued assistance throughout the year. It has really been an honour to work with such an amazing team of students. I would now like to introduce our keynote speaker for tonight, Mark Iris SC. Mark has had a very distinguished career in criminal law. He's currently the senior public defender and has worked on a number of high profile cases. Before this, Mark was a senior trial attorney for the Office of the Prosecutor at the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. He led the prosecution case against Stanislav Galic, a commander in the Bosnian Serb army. And this was a landmark case in international law because Galic was the first person to be charged and convicted with inflicting terror upon civilians, reinforcing international law's prohibition against harming civilians during times of war. So with that, I'm pleased to hand over to Mark, who will deliver the keynote address. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I want to congratulate the contributing authors um, and the editorial board of the journal and uh, the executive uh, editor, Wean Tan. I particularly want to congratulate David Yang for his work on this issue. And um, I note that this must be quite an evening for David, being a culmination of so much work over the last 15 months. His um, dream for this issue has come to fruition. The four essays that constitute the thematic part of this issue of the journal are a significant contribution to the academic literature on terrorism and international law. The essays deal with historical aspects of international law and terrorism, the political difficulties of achieving a cross-state united intelligence, military and legal response as well as political response to internal and external terrorist threats, the danger that the special forces military response, which is shaped to meet the domestic political constraints and battlefield challenges of terrorism, is overstepping the mark in terms of accountability. And finally, whether the extreme measure of extraordinary rendition has so overstepped the mark in terms of accountability. And finally, whether it has so overstepped the mark as to fall within the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court. Helen Duffy, Professor of International Human Rights Law and International Humanitarian Law at Leiden University, in her book, first published in 2005, The War on Terror, and the framework of international law described the search for an accepted definition of terrorism in international law as, quote, resembling the quest for the Holy Grail. Kimberly Trapp, in her essay titled The Potentialities and Limitations of Reactive Lawmaking, a case study in international terrorism suppression, traces the development of international law, in particular treaty law, in relation to terrorism since the time of the League of Nations 
as a response to terrorism committed by non-state actors. In this sense, ironically, the agenda of states creating a, a treaty regime of criminal law enforcement against terrorist acts has been set by those responsible for those criminal acts. Professor Ben Saul, who needs no introduction, in his book first published in 2006, Defining Terrorism in International Law, noted that, quote, disagreement about terrorism runs much deeper than technical disputes about drafting. It reflected doctrinal, ideological and jurisprudential arguments about who is entitled to exercise violence against whom and for what purposes. Kimberly Trapp's essay explains how, in spite of these difficulties, reactive treaty making has capitalised on the headline effect that David referred to of terrorist acts to give impetus to overcoming some of these disputes. The second article in the thematic section focuses on a regional state policy response to shared terrorist threats, namely Southeast Asia, a region of particular interest to Australia in terms of terrorism since the Bali bombings of 2002. Authors Sang Tan and Hitoshi Nasu note that compared to other regions of the world in recent decades, ASEAN states have been slow to adopt a treaty on counterterrorism. They examine the various reasons for this lacklustre pace, including a culture of non-interference between member states, a suspicion that neighbouring states harbour sources of military, militancy and terrorists, and domestic political resistance in the interests of national harmony. The essay provides a valuable understanding of how the complex political interrelationships of the states of our neighbouring region have made consensus on this issue difficult to achieve, but notes that since the ASEAN Convention on Counterterrorism, which finally came into force in 2013, the member states have benefited in building their legal and operational counterterrorist capacity. The third essay by John Moran, Time to Move Out of the Shadows, considers the role of special operations forces in counter-terrorism and counter-insurgency operations. Mr Moran acknowledges their positive role in response to recent terrorist activities and armed conflicts, but also examines the negative aspects of their operations, principally their secretiveness and the way in which they stand outside usual channels of accountability. One of their positive roles that he notes has been detaining war crime suspects in the Balkan conflict in the early 1990s. Indeed, many of those who found their way to The Hague, including a trial that I appeared in, were captured this way. Finally, Fiona Lau, in the fourth essay, examines the legality of American treatment of high-value detainees in the so-called War on Terror, particularly through its extraordinary rendition program and poses the question whether prosecutions for crimes against humanity by the International Criminal Court are possible and, if so, plausible. I want to share with you some thoughts on a few aspects of the challenge that terrorism poses for criminal law. An issue of the um, UNSW Law Journal with a thematic component on terrorism and international law has a particular appeal for me, both as a municipal criminal lawyer and an occasional international criminal lawyer. Often there are significant challenges for the defence in representing accused persons who are charged with terrorism offences, so as to ensure a fair trial. The often random nature of terrorist attacks against the community means the jurors, being drawn from the community at large, can identify as being part of the alleged target group and therefore can be predisposed against persons charged with such offences. This prejudice can be compounded by special measures being taken at trial where the authorities perceive a continuing threat. Such trials tend to be complex, lengthy and expensive, given the circumstantial nature of the evidence. Some of the evidence may be confronting to the jury, where it involves still images and video of violent and sometimes horrific acts. In the Elamar trial in 2008 and 2009, arising from the AFP operation known as Operation Pandanus, there were five accused. For the duration of the trial, which took 11 months, 
they were in a dock behind specially strengthened glass. Two of the five accused were represented by public defenders who dealt with those issues as best they could, but there is no perfect solution. The cornerstone of criminal law, both municipal and international, is individual criminal responsibility. The crime of terror in international humanitarian law often involves state actors and in that circumstance career military personnel and politicians for whom the prospect of trial and punishment in a municipal or international criminal court has a deterrent effect. To illustrate that, when I worked at The Hague in the Office of the Prosecutor for the UN International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, we used to have morning meetings where all the, the agency heads would come together. We'd call them prayer meetings. At one particular meeting, um, as we listened to the summary of what had happened um, relevantly according to the media in the previous 24 hours, we heard that a minister in the Macedonian government had expressed concern to his Prime Minister um, that by following um, the Prime Minister's orders to quell a public protest involving the Albanian minority population of Macedonia, um, he ran a risk of attracting the jurisdiction of the ICTY. Well then, responded the Prime Minister, you'd better make sure you act legally so that you don't. We were well pleased to hear that story. Query, however, whether a fanatical terrorist, however motivated, is as deterred or deterred at all by arrest, trial and the prospect of punishment. The failed <coughs> suicide bomber, be they a Sri Lankan Tamil tiger in the height of that armed conflict, or a lone wolf operating in a suicide mission in Western Europe, may have little fear of imprisonment and indeed embrace the opportunity to go on trial and spread the message. This potential impotence of criminal law is a conundrum challenging the rule of law itself. You may recall a few years ago gruesome images published by ISIL of an Australian-born terrorist, Khaled Sharouf, in Syria, holding up the head of what he claimed to be an executed Syrian prisoner. Worse still, images of one of his young children doing likewise at his behest. Sharouf had previously been imprisoned in New South Wales for a terrorist-related offence. He was one of those charged as part of Operation Pandanus and pleaded guilty to a charge involving possession of six clocks, 140 batteries and a video containing instructions as to how to construct and detonate an explosive device. His sentence had been mitigated by evidence that he had suffered from schizophrenia at the time of his offence in circumstances which had lessened his criminal culpability and made him an inappropriate vehicle for general and specific deterrence. And I might add there was nothing improper at all about the sentence and it was not appealed by either the prosecution or defence. At the time those images were published, Sharouf claimed in a, a public statement that he had feigned the mental illness to fool the courts into giving him a reduced prison sentence. Since then, he is thought to have been killed in an airstrike. Sharouf's claim that he feigned mental illness may well have been a delusion itself. In other words, he may still have been suffering from schizophrenia. An experienced forensic psychiatrist had given evidence at his sentence of his illness, which was well documented over years beforehand. The psychiatrist maintained his opinion following Sharouf's later claim. Nevertheless, clearly the punishment handed down by our criminal justice system had done nothing to deter Sharouf. Fanatical terrorism is a formidable challenge to the criminal justice system in other ways. Sharouf had spent most of his time in prison in the secluded, what's known as the High Risk Management Unit at Goulburn and Lithgow prisons, despite recommendations that he be transferred to a secure psychiatric unit. The same psychiatrist whose evidence was used on sentence claimed that the outcome may have been different had Sharouf been treated for his mental illness in prison. This touches on another dilemma. Allowing such prisoners to mix in the prison population may facilitate the spread of a terrorist culture, but on the other hand isolating them may concentrate their antisocial terrorist mindset. 
These are difficult choices. Corrective Services now has a course designed for prisoners who are committed to politically or religiously motivated violence, known as PRISM, P-R-I-S-M. So it will be interesting to see how that unfolds in terms of its impact on prisoners who have terrorist ideolo ideologies. One of the challenges in international criminal law has been to isolate the criminal culpability of terrorising a civilian population, particularly as a war crime. Um, as David has mentioned, a senior trial attorney for the Office of the Prosecutor in ICTY, I led the prosecution case in a trial involving the infliction of terror on the civilian population as a war crime, the Galich trial. Since World War I, bombing campaigns on civilian populations as a means of leveraging military victories through the infliction of terror has been condemned. However, little happened to fashion that concern into a discreet war crime, as opposed to an adjunctive descriptor of behaviour consequential to other existing crimes, such as the deliberate or reckless targeting of civilians. The massive bombing campaigns of civilian populations by both sides in the European theatre of World War II, such as the German bombing of British cities and the Allied bombing of Hamburg and other German cities, led ultimately to the issue being addressed in the 1977 Additional Protocols to the 1949 Geneva Conventions. Article 51.2 of Additional Protocol 1 and Article 13 of Additional Protocol 2 are in identical terms. The civilian population as such, as well as individual civilians, shall not be the object of attack. Acts or threats of violence, the primary purpose of which is to spread terror among the civilian population, are prohibited. The first time these provisions were invoked as the basis of a war crime was in the Galich trial in the ICTY. The context was the three-year siege of Sarajevo, the capital of Bosnia and Herzegovina. For two of those years, Galich was the commander of the 18,000 Bosnian Serb troops that encircled the city. He was unable to deal a final military blow to clinch victory because although he had the advantage in firepower, some 1,000 pieces of heavy um, artillery, tanks, um, rocket launchers and the like. He was heavily outnumbered by the 90,000 soldiers defending the city. And so what transpired was a stalemate, very much like a World War I battlefield with trench lines so close that they could throw bombs at each other. So instead of um, seeking a, a battlefield victory, pursuant to orders from his military superiors, he sought to undermine public morale by deliberately targeting civilians by small arms, mortars, rockets and his heavy artillery. The consequence was that for three years the 400,000 civilians trapped in the city lived in a permanent state of terror, regardless of whether they were in their apartments or on the streets. They lived with the terror of knowing that they and their loved ones could be killed at any moment. At the outset of the conflict, the parties had agreed to be bound by the Geneva Conventions. So the issue for determination was confined to treaty law. There was no need for the court to determine whether the crime existed as such in customary international law. A challenge for me and the prosecution team as a whole was to convey to the court the enormity of this alleged crime by Galich. We set out to prove that he was responsible for over a thousand civilian deaths and over 10,000 civilian serious injuries that could be attributed to his campaign of sniping and shelling civilians, not only as part of the evidence base for the terror count but also as the basis for two separate counts of crimes against humanity, the foundational crimes being murder and serious injury. We were concerned that there would be a temptation for the court 
to give primary consideration to the crimes against humanity counts and discount the terror allegation as somehow less serious. We set out to convey to the court through the evidence of surviving victims, eyewitness accounts from journalists and peacekeepers and video, just what the experience of living in constant terror for a period of years was like. And we also included expert evidence um, from a British psychiatrist who specialised um, in torture um, of refugees. We wanted to make the point that as serious as a thousand murders is and 10,000 seriously injured victims, terrorising a civilian population of a city is uniquely serious. This was a continuing crime in which Galich's mens rea was refreshed on a daily basis. The court had to determine first whether such a crime as a crime of terror existed. It said this, the majority is of the view that an offence constituted of acts of violence willfully directed against the civilian population or individual civilians causing death or serious injury to body or health within the civilian population with the primary purpose of spreading terror among the civilian population, namely the crime of terror as a violation of the laws or customs of war, formed part of the law to which the accused and his subordinates were subject to during the indictment period. The accused knew or should have known that this was so. Terror as a crime within international humanitarian law was made effective in this case by treaty law. Whether the crime of terror also has a foundation in customary law is not a question which the majority is required to answer. Galich was convicted of this offence and the two counts of crimes against humanity for murder and inhumane acts and received a sentence of life imprisonment. It's one of the very few sentences of life imprisonment that have been handed down by the ICTY. And his was the first. Galich was the first person to be convicted of the war crime of terror, but he was neither the, the first nor the last military commander to order his subordinates to commit such acts. In the last few years, the Syrian government is alleged to have used chlorine on civilian populations in rebel controlled areas. In the last few days, there have been reports of bunker busting bombs being dropped in civilian areas of Aleppo, causing massive civilian casualties and terrorising the civilian population. There is much work still to be done. In the meantime, I commend the authors of these valuable essays and the editor and editorial board for ensuring such a high quality contribution to the store of knowledge and discourse on terrorism in international law. Thank you. Thank you, Mark, very much um, for that speech. Um, it highlighted the importance of this thematic to scholarship on terrorism in international law, but it went well beyond that. Using his own role in the criminal justice system in both a national and, in and international context in the ICTY, Mark was able to bring us into some of the real um, challenges in this area. Terrorism, in short, is a complex problem and how we deal with it both domestically and internationally is complex. At the moment, most of the solutions that one reads about are simplistic. Um, the journal had an opportunity, and I think um, the credit goes here to David Yang for, for selecting this topic as an issue, to allow some of the challenges in this debate to be explored in a lot more depth. Um, and I hope that people take it on board and read the articles. Um, now, the journal has a history of distinguished keynote speakers, and Mark, your speech sits well among that group um, in encouraging us to think um, and really putting us in the situation. Um, and thank you very much for that. To all the students involved in the Univers University of New South Wales Jur Law Journal, thank you very much. You are among our best and our brightest, 
Your ability to edit and strong grammar skills no doubt placing you high on the wish list of firms such as this one. I would like in particular to thank the executive editor, Wee An Tan, for his leadership and initiative in developing a new strategic plan for the journal, which will ensure that it remains among Australia's premier law journals for years to come. I would also like to thank David Yang for producing an excellent issue, and I can say this as I received it yesterday and am most of the way through reading it. Um, there are lots of excellent contributions there and I hope people um, take the time to read them. And on that note, I would like to thank the authors, not only of the thematic, as, as has already been discussed, um, but also of the general issue, and there are some wonderful contributions there. Two articles deal with important issues within criminal law. Julia Quilter and her co-authors have conducted an extensive survey on the context in which intoxication is relevant to police power, the formulation of an offence as an aggravation factor or affects the level of punishment, problematising in particular the lack of a clear and appropriate definition in many of those contexts. Um, John Anderson dips into the enigmatic crime of arson, looking at how recklessness has been and ought to be interpreted in this context. Or, if you like, in short, what happens if you intend to singe a couch and the house burns down? Jesse Blackburn appraises the first term of the Independent National Security Legislation Monitor, Brett Walker SC, pointing out that the main problem is not so much with the job he did, but with the government's willingness to act on his recommendations. Linda Steele discusses the controversial question of court-authorised sterilisation of women and girls with a disability while Trevor Ryan and his co-authors discuss voting rights for persons with mental disabilities. Vivian Brand explains how a better whistleblowing regulatory regime would reduce foreign bribery by Australian corporations. John Azzi analyses the problematic status of natural, natural justice rights within Australia's private tax ruling system. And Nathan Van Wees discusses the place of the zone of interest tests in Australian standing law after the High Court decision in Argos. Finally, Andrew Lynch and George Williams have written another contribution to what might be the closest thing the UNSW Law Journal has come to a regular gossip column. It notes Justice Hayden's and also Justice Gagler's self-exclusion from collective judgment writing and why this doesn't necessarily mean that they are outliers, as well as an update on who is writing with whom. Finally, I would like to thank um, Herbert Smith Freehills and particularly Michael Visakis for hosting this event. Um, I've got to say, um, the law school um, benefits as well from the very close relationship it has with the legal profession and particularly firms like Herbert Smith Freehills. If we are Gandalf, um, then the, um, then the um, law firms are something like Boromir or Faramir in The Lord of the Rings, fighting on the front lines. Now, I am an alumna, in particular, of Freehill Holling, Dallin Page, as it then was, and have many fond memories of both the intellectual property and funds management groups at this firm. And both the faculty and the journal are grateful to, Freehill, to Herbert Smith Freehills for hosting this event tonight and for their premier sponsorship of the journal. I would also like to acknowledge the other premier sponsors, Allen's Linklaters and King, King and Wood Mallisons, with which the faculty and the journal also have a very close relationship. And last of all, thank you to everyone here for coming and helping to mark um, um, volume 39, issue three, in a journal that has lived as long as I have. <laughs>